Uh, we did that last time, didn't you? <laughs> just because, for the sake of time, welcome those back that are online. We just like to, uh, Rib and I would just like to do a song. And that. And it's not that one, Daniel. Why? Not the one, not the song, not the song. <laughs> so, uh, I, I think you're fairly familiar with this this one. No! I'm quite difficult with that in my pocket. It's going to slide around on No! This should be one that you're you're familiar with. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is the light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid rock, burned through the fiercest storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears assail, my striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ to people singing who worship a different God or have a different philosophy in life, that spirit comes through the, uh, the music. And so I thought, well, we need to sing our own song. <laughs> sing a new song. Sing a new song. Where <laughs> <laughs> have I heard that before? <laughs> so, uh, uh, and so if any of you got songs that you've written, or uh, would like to, yeah, would like to share, we'd like to record as, as much as we can of our own, our own music, our own worship before our Father in Heaven. Uh, sorry? That was so nice. You enjoyed that? Yeah. Can I, can I uh, share a couple of things that um, Michael Nixon and Danny, Danny Brown are um, chatting about this morning? Um, it's really interesting. Good. Michael says, 
we see this the father's same character displayed following the first human death, Genesis 4.15. God gave God handed out a life sentence. He did not hand out a death sentence. It's just in, they were chatting a bit before I got back yeah. to you. Shall we share what they were chatting about? About if God killed if he wouldn't if God was in the business of killing people as a punishment, he would have been in the business of just nipping it in the bud <laughs> yes. right back at the beginning. But like you know, when Cain from Abel, he didn't even he didn't have out a death sentence. He he had out a life sentence. So yes. God's in the business of prolonging life, not, mm. not causing death. Amen. Amen. So they're just interesting what they're chatting about here. Yes. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And in him was life, and the light was the light of men. So. so Michael is in Canada, and Danny's in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> No, nice to nice to join us. We, we had we had about three or four sites in Canada. We had one in the US, we had one in Thailand, we had a few uh, Victoria. I just put someone on now. And then is she on? Sorry? I, put, I just put someone on in Victoria now. And then. Only if they comment. Okay. I don't know otherwise. And so, um, um, Apart from that, there is still someone who's hoping to come, so I don't know if, the, if we keep the door slightly ajar so they can okay, get in. On. Someone who is uh, at the moment from Monterey, California, but oh, is, okay. wants to yeah, visit yeah. us, Chris. So we're, we're so hoping. It's quite an uh, international thing happening online. So um, thank you, Eddie, for sharing, sharing this morning. Yes. Lots of important thoughts there. Mm. Uh, the, the wonderful thing about the journey we're on is, as you mentioned before, about climbing cliffs and uh, there's so many wonderful things that the Lord is showing us at the present time and uh, today is no exception. Last Sabbath, Ruben and I were travelling, uh, visiting a church uh, down in Bow Desert and uh, on the way down we just had this awesome Bible study, it was so cool and I just thought, oh, I'm going to share some of this. Uh, so, uh, and tie it together with some of the journey that we've had over the last number of years. So, uh, if, we, if we can kneel, uh, and then after that, I'm going to read something that Marco would like me to read. So, let's, uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for the Sabbath. We thank you that we can believe as your son believed from the very beginning, that we are your children in whom you are well pleased. We thank you that the faith of Jesus can reside in us, despite the feeling, despite feeling possibly lost, feeling worthless, feeling helpless. None of those feelings determine our destiny, but the word of God alone. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. We take hold of that. We pray that today, as we think about as in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. We pray that you would bless us as we share together. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Marco has asked me to share something with you because he doesn't, uh, he said, I don't want to uh, choke up in the middle. And this really epitomizes uh, the journey that so many of us are on. Uh, I know Marco is he's facing, like many of us, he's facing some challenges. And this is a, this is a, a letter to his daughter, Liesl. We're going to get tissues here, Marco. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> this really epitomizes what it's all about. And so it's a joy and it's a privilege for me to to share this. I mean, obviously I'd like you to do it, but uh, I understand it's, it's difficult. Uh, being separated from his daughter at the present time, this is what he's, uh, Marco has written. A love letter to my daughter, Lisa. See if you can hear our Father in Heaven speaking through Marco to his daughter. Oh, my precious daughter, how I enjoy seeing you growing up with the beauties like flowers turning towards the light and face your back towards the dark that ca carry no life. I've seen you growing in your mummy's belly and we both knew that you would be our joy in our lives. When mum gave birth to you, there was a moment that mum couldn't stand the pain anymore and was almost giving up, as if she could. <laughs> like that was an option. <laughs> option <B. laughs> Sorry, honey, we're going through now. Uh, yes. 
I told her that she is the only one who can finish the job. <laughs> what a man. <laughs> but I'm here for you, honey. Short, uh, shortly after that, you came out of her body as a little baby, born in the flesh, containing a beautiful soul, given by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I've got to... Uh, sorry, I've got to press the more button. Are you... Uh, you got, I only got, only got part way down, Marco, and now I, I've hit more and it's, have you got internet? I hope so. Um, it's buzzing around there. Stay tuned, folks. No internet connection. Oh. Let me uh, go to your, because we want to, I want to hear the rest of this. <laughs> uh, there it is. Oz Rock Cave. That's uh, there it is. Now I can continue. Uh, when you grew up, I do remember that you loved to hear and see the story of Noah. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Do you remember? You asked me to read the story of the big boat and the animals. I knew for sure that Jesus is dwelling in you. On the end of the story, the Lord put a rainbow in the sky. The promise that he would never, ever flood the world again. To see a rainbow every day is almost impossible, but you can see the colours every day, especially in the flowers you love. Well, I found a special rock for you. It was looking very rough with sharp points and sharp edges. And so as the Lord is shaping us and getting rid of the sharp edges and rough corners, I was turning it into a beautiful gem. It will represent God's work. He shapes us and gets rid of our roughness, making us shine as a beautiful gem. Amen. It makes uh, in silver, which are the, it is made in silver, which are the hands of the Lord to hold the rainbow, to let it shine in all its beauty. Only if you carry the truth, honesty, faithfulness and salvation represents light and life you will be able to recognize the color of life. If there is no light, life, you will not see the rainbow. For you, my dearest daughter, I pray that Jesus will always dwell in you to give you light in your life to be shown the path, your ever-loving daddy. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Marco. <laughs> That's the spirit of our Father, isn't it? Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, you finally made it. <laughs> now you can relax. <laughs> that was beautiful. We want more stories uh, like this. And this is the story of Elijah, isn't it? The, the message of Elijah. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. You are my beloved child and whom I am well pleased. To turn away from Satan, I will ascend into heaven. I will be like the most high and all of that, all of that kind of thing. So you've set my story up really well because that's exactly what I'm going to talk about, Marco, is about Noah. Uh, so if we turn in our bi uh, Bibles to Matthew 24, I'm going to turn to the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 24. Sorry, just to, a verse to finish off Marco's thing. Psalm 144. That our sons made his plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters... Maybe his cornerstone polished after the similitude of the palace. There you go. Psalm 144, verse 12. 144, 12. That makes sense. <laughs> this is really important for us to understand. We know that the Bible says that all things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so everything written in the beginning is for us at the end. Uh, as it says that the Lord uh, tells from the beginning the things that are at the end. So we read in Matthew 24, verse 38, For as in the days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So the story of Noah gives us a template for what will happen in the last days. And we are living in the last days. According to Daniel chapter 2, the image, the four metals, 
the, the clay and the iron at the very end. The next part of the equation is the coming of the Son of Man at the end of time. And so I want to look at this story of Noah and pull out just a few points which I think you will find amazing. Because this point has been brought out before. If in the days of Noah, this is a template for the last days, that means that today we need to be building an ark, don't we? Amen. We need to be building an ark or know where the ark is so we can get into it to endure the great deluge that's going to come upon the earth. This is because this is what Jesus tells us. So the great misconception that people have about the story of Noah is that God destroyed them all in a flood. That's what most people believe. God just destroyed them all. But we want to show the process by which this destruction took place, where the responsibility lies, and what, uh, what took place. So come to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. For those of us who are familiar with the divine pattern, I want to show you that verses uh, 5 and 6 are the source of the destruction and that verses 11 to 13 show the channel of how that destruction takes place. And thankfully, Eddie's given us a bit of a, a precursor to the divine pattern on the, the source and channel relationship. So it says in verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. So now we're talking about men who are dwelling on the earth and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Does that have any parallel to today? Their thoughts are only evil continually. Now we could reason that these men before the flood had minds far superior to ours, but we have invented ways, we have sought out ways to catch up to them. We have the internet, we have devices that we can look at images and pictures and hear sounds to fill our minds with wickedness 24 hours a day. So we're able to catch up with the antediluvians and, and completely pollute our minds. It's on tap continually, every day. For whoever wants to download, watch, view, whatever filth uh, you want to watch, it's available. So that men's minds are wicked continually. And it says, and it repented the Lord, or the Lord was sorry. He had sorrow in his heart, we would read that, that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So we see that these two verses are focusing on what aspect of man? His mind, his imagination, his thinking. It's talking about the mind of man, okay? The spirit of man. This is what is what it's talking about, okay? And that his thoughts are, are wicked continually. Now come down to verse 11. It says, the earth also was corrupt. Now when you read those words, the earth was corrupt, what do you think? What's it talking about? People on the earth. You're thinking about the people on the earth, but that's not what it says. It says, the earth, Eretz which is Hebrew, for earth. The earth was corrupt. It was polluted. Okay, and the Bible explains to us very clearly how this pollution came about. Verse 5 and 6 tell us the corruption of man, how he had polluted his mind. Verse 11 says that the earth was corrupt. Now that word for corrupt in the Hebrew is exactly the same word as in verse 13 that says destroy. It's exactly the same Hebrew word. So you can translate this word. You can translate this word, destroy. So here in verse 11, the earth also was what? Destroyed. The earth was destroyed. Okay, this is important to understand. Before God and the earth was filled with? Now when you've read that text in the past, you think of the people on the earth, but it's not talking about that. It's talking about the earth itself. The earth itself was filled with violence. So how does this, how does this work? 
Verse 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was destroyed, for because all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So why was the earth destroyed? Because man, in his imaginations, in his evil thinking, was having an influence on the earth. And this violence that was in man was having an effect on the earth so that the violent, as you said, spirit of man, his spirit, his violent spirit, was going into the earth. And the earth is reflecting the nature of man. We need to look at this very carefully. Verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. The earth is filled with violence. And again, it's not talking about the people. It's saying the earth is filled with violence. He's, God is looking down and he's saying, I can see that the end is here. Because the earth, within the earth itself, is stored up so much violence from man that the earth itself is about to completely tear itself apart because of the wickedness of man. He says, I can see this. Isn't that a parallel with Revelation? Yes. God will destroy them that destroy the earth. This is, this is what is going to take place. And why will God destroy them that destroy the earth? This is what it says here. Notice what it says. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. The earth itself is filled with violence through them, through their actions. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So what is God saying? That's what he did through the flood. Through the flood. And the next one which is coming in the future is not through water. Yeah. Because water wouldn't do the job. And that's another whole story all of itself in terms of the gods that they worshipped in the antediluvian days. If you look at the fish mitre that the Pope wears, and the god in the antediluvian days was a god of water. And so what was the god that destroyed them? Water. The god that we worship today is a god of fire. So what is the god that's going to destroy people today? A god of fire. This is, this is why the earth back then was destroyed by water, but today it will be by fire because of the imaginations of man himself. But that's another whole, another whole story. So it says, I will destroy them with the earth, meaning the earth is corrupted, it's destroyed. I'm not going to stop the process of events. I'm going to let man to be destroyed with the earth. As a man sows, so shall he also reap. This is important because many times we read these verses and we say the earth was corrupt and we think, oh, it's talking about man. No, it's talking about the earth itself has become corrupt through them. Just look at that verse again. The end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them. That's in verse 13. Through them it is filled with violence. And so... Um, Come now to Isaiah 24. That was it, sir. Isaiah 24. Thank you. We'll, we'll see exactly how this works. We were talking a bit about this last year, and this particular subject needs to be studied very carefully in how we understand uh, the relationship between man and the earth. And we've said, and I'm just to reiterate briefly, what is man made of? The dust of the earth. And man was given dominion over what? Over the earth. So man is made of earth and he's given dominion over the earth. So there is a source channel relationship between man and the earth. The, man, the, the, the earth, of course, is an inanimate, it's not a living being. It doesn't have a consciousness of its own. It simply has laws of nature that operate. And it responds to inputs and it gives you outputs. You know, it's, the destruction of this world is a simple process which we all are familiar with and that is garbage in, garbage out. That's how it's all going to end. You put garbage in, you get garbage out. That's the law of nature. Nature simply operates on a law. You put garbage into it, you get garbage out of it. That's how the earth is going to end. It doesn't have a mind. It doesn't think. It doesn't reason. It just... It's programmed. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Righteousness in, righteousness out. 
That's, that's how it works. So we look at Isaiah chapter 24. Yeah. And we look at verse 4. Yeah. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. So notice again, when it says the earth mourneth, what is it talking about? The whole creation groaneth and travaileth. The earth mourneth. Now that you could say that's a personification of the earth. Like the, there's a suffering in the creation that's taking place. And, fa and fadeth away. The world languisheth. And then it moves to the haughty people of the earth do languish. The pride, the arrogance of man. Why? Verse 5, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants. So we see the language here. How is the earth defiled? So the earth has the capacity to be defiled by the actions of men. This, this is a scary thing. As a man sows, so shall he also reap. It's a simple law of nature. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants of man thereof. Why? Because they transgress what? The law. The law. Christianity everywhere. We're free from the law. That is a principle of destruction. It brings defilement upon the earth to say that men are free from law. Because it says here, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken what? The covenant. The everlasting covenant. God wanted to reintroduce the everlasting covenant to this world through a group of people called Seventh-day Adventists in 1888. He wanted to reintroduce the everlasting covenant to bring righteousness onto the earth, to slow down the violence of men. And the Seventh-day Adventist church, when Jesus came to them, went smack in the face of Jesus. We don't want you. We'll do it our way. We have the truth. We know what Galatians chapter 3 is about. We know what to do. And Christ was rejected. And the everlasting covenant was violated. And the world descended into World War 1 and 2 as a result. But that's another whole story. Verse 6. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth. Devoured the earth. And they that dwell therein are desolate. I'll just come back to that. I was visiting in South Africa at the end of last year, and I visited uh, the, the place where um, Andrew Murray had been pastor, the great Dutch Reform minister, and of course Cecil, uh, who was the man? I've forgotten. The, the man who became an Adventist who was a diamond, he had the diamond. Uh, yeah, Cecil. Uh, uh, yeah, Cecil. The Can't remember. The Yeah, yeah. I can't remember the name. I think that's right. Anyway, this man, Ellen White wrote to him and was pleading with him. He'd been an Adventist, but he got estranged from the church. And she, she wrote to him, and he looked at the letters later on. She said that if you had been faithful and had have served the Lord and done that which was correct, the ball war never would have happened. How would you like to read a letter like that? How would you know? This is the responsibility we're talking about in terms of if, if certain men making decisions, because this man had a lot of money and he could have used it to preach the third angel's message, the everlasting gospel, and things were done. Now, it's not only him. There's a, there's a long story involved there. Now, the men in America, the men in America, let's not go there. There were problems in America as well. And the, how can I say, the attitudes of Englishmen towards the Boers. Shall I go on? Maybe not. Maybe not. We won't go there. The second class status of these individuals. The Boers. So uh, anyway, that's another whole story. Are the Englishmen alone guilty of racism? <coughs> we all have seen. <laughs> are we, we going to say, oh, thank you, God, I'm not like that? No. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not like that. We're all in that boat. Therefore, verse 6, Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. So what brings about the desolation? 
The curse devours the earth. How does the curse devour the earth? Men break the laws, the commandments, the ordinance. Change the ordinance. Change the ordinance. Rejected the everlasting covenant. Rejected the everlasting covenant. Now change the ordinance. That is... That's really big. Really, really big. The appeasement-based understanding of sacrifice. They change the ordinance into something where you are appeasing God by giving a sacrifice. We did esteem you smitten of God and afflicted. This, we change the ordinance. This is, this is what's taking place. So Christ came to cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. But that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a really deep thought. But we won't, we won't go too far into there. Now, come back to Genesis 3. Let's look at the curse. Genesis 3. It says in Proverbs 26, the curse causeless shall not come. So there's always a cause and effect relationship. Every curse that comes is a cause. Is a cause. You know? When I'm growing vegetables in my backyard and they get eaten up with whatever, there's a cause. Did this man sin or was it my neighbour that caused the bugs to come onto my plants? That's a ministration of death, isn't it? <laughs> You ever, ever had, you know, what caused my plants to get wiped out? Oh, it's life, I guess. It's because sin is in the world. Because sin is in the world. But if it's my property, who has the biggest ownership over what happens on my property? You can't do anything about it. <laughs> you can. <laughs> Remember the statutes and the judgments, which were given by Moses. So, and I'll, yeah, that's another whole story, but... We've got, we've got a big ministration of death coming on this issue. The, the reason why we don't get to see so much of our sinfulness is because we buy our food from Coles and Woolworths. And Aldi. So if we grew out... <laughs> and Aldi. Aldi, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you racist. <laughs> so, we, <laughs> so we don't get to... Ex many of us don't get to experience, oh, why are my plants not growing? Oh, it's got nothing to do with me. So uh, that's, a, that's another whole... Anyway, let's come back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground. Why is the ground cursed? Because the thoughts of man, who is made of dust, have a direct effect... They have a direct input mechanism into the earth. God doesn't say, okay, because you've done this, I'm going to take my magic cursed dust and I'm going to throw the dust into the earth and you're going to live with it. If you believe that, man, cursed is the ground for what? For your sake. For your sake. How is it for our sake that the earth should be cursed? For education. For education. Yes. To teach us. A feedback mechanism. When things start going wrong, when floods, famine, earthquakes, pestilence and disease start to come, it's a feedback mechanism. Stop! You're breaking the commandments. You, you need to come back to God. But Satan wants to put the Christian world onto a platform that coming back to God means enforcing a Sunday law rather than a Sabbath... or well, not enforcing any Sabbath law, or rather than coming to openly, freely, to the blessings of the Sabbath. And so this curse falls upon the earth. I want to read you, this is a statement from, uh, I, I just found it in Councils and Died and Food of all places, 145, talking of Eve, she was intemperate in her desires. She ate, and through her influence, her husband ate also, and a curse rested upon them both. What's the curse that rested upon them? Intemperance. Affecting the body. Yeah, yeah. Well, did, did, did they take a whole lot of the fruit of the tree? Did they gorge themselves? And mm -hmm. Maybe she did. I, I don't know. We're not told, are we? Mm -hmm. But what is the curse that fell upon them? Guilt. Guilt from knowing you have done something against the one who has given you everything. That weighs on you. This curse is upon you. This sense of guilt rests upon you. 
And that was the curse that rested on them. And then it says, the earth also was cursed because of their sin. There's the relationship. And this is why we read the statement in the spirit of prophecy that when Adam sinned and the leaves started to fall from the trees, that Adam wept more for the leaves that fell off those trees than men now weep for their dead. Adam caused because he wept because he knew he had caused that. When Adam ate the fruit of the tree and he took the philosophy of Satan, he may as well go on round with a 44 Magnum and shot every animal in the garden and killed everything, burnt everything with Asian orange and destroyed the lot of it. Because that's what he did. He blew the whole lot up. It just hadn't manifested itself yet. But the spirit now was going into the earth, this spirit of destruction. And he was the one. He's crying, he's weeping. I've done this. I've done this to all the creation. I've killed all the animals. I've killed everything. That's guilt. To carry that weight upon you. And so when he turned to the lamb, in slaying that lamb, he's recognizing, I've done this. I have done this. His action in taking the life of that lamb was not just symbolism. It was reality. Because that's what he did to that lamb. Do do you understand what we're saying? He, in effect, had done this to this lamb by his actions. He had killed this lamb. And he was simply manifesting the reality of what he had done in order to confess the wickedness of his sinfulness. And he couldn't imagine what was coming up for him would occur. Mm. Could not imagine that the destruction of Eden. He, it says in uh, Spirit of Prophecy that he begged to be able to stay in Eden, not realizing that Eden was gone. In the invisible, it was already gone. It was already a desert. But it just hadn't manifested itself yet. So he had already left the garden. In, in the invisible. You've got to think about these things. So God kicking him out of the garden. Just think about it. He'd already left the garden up here. He'd already wiped everything out up here. It just hadn't manifested itself. So, Adrian, I always say that garden remained as a witness, didn't it? Well, it does. It does remain through the blood of the Lamb. But then in reality, couldn't they see it? The, The garden with the angels protecting it? Yes, because when they moved out, their spirit no longer affected the garden. They moved out of the garden. But their spirit have, was no longer polluting the garden. But they would have loved access to the tree yes. of life. Yes. Well, then, you know, with a witness like that, you can't imagine that they do the opposite. Well, <laughs> living in my own brain, Ian, I think I can understand why they did, from my own experience. Just. Moving on. So, what is this curse? We talked about guilt. We come to Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. This is the curse. And this comes to the heart of the message that we've been sharing for many years now to overturn the the curse. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what will he do? He will do exactly what he did to Marco in writing to his daughter. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, as it says here, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Oh, hallelujah. Hearts of the children to their fathers, to come back to the God of their fathers, to come back from the brink. Hallelujah for the Elijah message. And then what what does it say then? Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. What is the curse? The curse is the sense of being an orphan. The sense of being cut off from your father. The sense of I've done wrong and I can't cope with the guilt of what I have done. That's what Cain said. My iniquity is greater than can be forgiven. In the margin, this is what it says. That's the curse. This is the curse that is resting upon the earth right now. And that curse is going into the earth. 
into the earth, this worthlessness, this sense of abandonment. And of course, that abandonment is stirring up in the heart of man violence. We are seeing violence in the earth. Men are becoming violent and aggressive in their natures. And this spirit is going into the earth, into the earth, and the earth, which was designed to reflect back beauty and joy and righteousness, is preparing to destroy itself as a reflection of what man is doing. Didn't the Creator say, your brother's blood cries out from the ground? The brother's blood cries out from the ground. Well, that, when you read on further, uh, bloodshed was quite common. And I want to read you, read you something uh, from the Spirit of Prophecy on this that, is, uh, that is, is very interesting. And we've got a bit of material to cover, so maybe we'll hold the comments until the end. And Because uh, I don't want to get to the punchline of this one. And it's already 20 past 12. So, um, I want to read you this, this statement from Spirit Prophecy, Volume 1. While Abel justifies the plan of God, Cain becomes enraged and his anger increases and burns against Abel until in his rage he slays him. God inquires of Cain for his brother and Cain utters a guilty falsehood. There's the curse that's resting on him. I know not, because Cain not only killed his brother, he killed his parent's child. He watched his parents bowed over the form of his brother, sobbing in agony. What would you feel? You'd want to drop into a hole in the ground and disappear. You wouldn't know. You would be a fugitive and a vagabond. You wouldn't know where to go. Your relationship with your parents would be very strained. Because you knew you had inflicted such a wound on your parents that he said, my iniquity is greater than to be forgiven. I can't be forgiven for this. Look at the pain that I've inflicted on my parents. Look at the sorrow. Look at the, my father's stooped shoulders as he walks around. I did this to him. And if he's not thinking about it, Satan's reminding him of it. You little murderer. You did this. You did this to your parents. In order to hang on to him, to keep him from believing that he could be forgiven. He reminds him constantly of his guilt. Don't have anything to do with this lamb sacrifice thing. Get away from that. You don't want to get anywhere near forgiveness because I want to hang on to you and keep you bound in your worthlessness. And so it says, God informed Cain that he knew in regard to his sin that he was acquainted with every, with his every act, even the thought of his heart, and says to him, Thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth. You thought about that way? Thou art cursed where? From where? From the earth. That's an interesting statement. Which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. What's going on here? The earth is opening her mouth to receive the brother's blood. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto, her, unto thee her strength. It's interesting. So man in taking another man's life, the earth is affected and it does not give. You take life from the earth, you are taking life from me to produce. And of course it's God who gives the life to produce. And this is a law of nature. God has set the laws of nature. And when you kill, the earth will not produce. The earth will be overrun with pests. The earth will be overrun, it, and you cannot, and weeds are everywhere. And the earth becomes hard. This is all reflecting the murderous nature of man. Then it says, he says, a fugitive and a vagabond you shall be in the earth. So this spirit of a fugitive and a vagabond will continue to fall onto the earth. The curse upon the ground at first had been felt but lightly. But now a double curse rested upon it. The spirit, the act of Cain, which was, and let's think about this, what Cain did to Abel was a manifestation of what Adam had done to Christ when he allowed Satan to come into his life. Does that make sense? It was, a, it was taking the seed that Adam had planted and it manifested in a way that shocked Adam. 
But he had planted that seed. And this is a, this is a test for us as parents when we see ch uh, behaviours in our children and we can act shocked that our children would ever behave like this when we planted the seed. We planted the seeds upon which they then act. That's very humiliating. As Jacob found out with his sons, <coughs> God saw that the more he enriched, and I want you to notice this, this is in Spirit of Prophecy, page 81. These things have a very important uh, bearing for us today. God saw that the more he enriched and prospered sinful man, the more he corrupted his way before him. The more that God gave gifts to men, the more that men corrupted themselves. These treasures, which should have led men to glorify the bountiful giver, had been worshipped instead of God while the giver had been rejected. This is Romans chapter 1. Who knowing God glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, we talked about before, gratitude, neither were thankful, but became what in their imagination? Vain in their imagination. It says here, the beautiful regular shaped mountains had disappeared. This is talking about the flood. Stones, ledges, ragged rocks appeared upon some parts of the earth which were before out of sight. Where had been hills and mountains, no traces of them were visible. Where had been beautiful plains covered with verdure and lovely plants, hills and mountains were formed of stone, trees and earth above the bodies of men and beasts. The whole surface of the earth presented an appearance of disorder. Why did it appear, give an appearance of disorder? Because men's minds were disordered. The mind of man ref was reflected in the earth. This is what is happening. Because there's a direct relationship between men and the earth. Now notice this. Some parts of the earth were more disfigured than others. Where once, uh, where once had been earth's richest, tre uh, richest treasures of gold, silver and precious stones. Now where would be these places where the richest treasures of gold and silver and stones? Well she said earlier that... Uh, he, the more he enriched man, the more corrupt his ways were before him. These treasures, which should have been led to glorify, they worshipped the creature rather than the creator. So in the places where the most idolatrous worship was practiced, the most abominable practice, practices were taking place, it says, here was seen the heaviest marks of the curse. Does that make sense? In the place where men are being the most abominable, the spirit in that region is having a greater effect of curse on the earth than in other places. Does that make sense? So here's the question. We just want to put this in here. It's just a little side note. If you're living in the midst of a city where there's a lot of wicked people, what's going to happen to the earth in that place? The earth is going to erupt in violence in those places. This is what's going to happen. Wow. Wow. So, the, the, the council to leave the cities has to do with the curse. Has to do with this curse. It's, it's just simply a law of nature. It's not God saying, well, I'm going to, I'm going to. No, it's none of that. It's simply a law of nature. The places where the most abominable practices are being done, where there's high concentrations of wickedness of men in the earth, those, the earth in those places is going to react with violence as a natural consequence of garbage in, garbage out. It's, it's just a law of nature. So, um, now we want to come to something very interesting because it has it bears significance on recent events in Australia that took place at the end of last year. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 25. Leviticus 18:25. It's one of those chapters that you would rather not read. And in the beginning, it says, "Don't do in verse two and three, after the manner of the Canaanites, where you are going, and after the manner of the Egyptians, where you have come from, you will not do." And these are the things that they were doing. And I'm not going to read them all to you. Uh, but um, we'll start with verse 25. and get to, Well, 
Let's not just read that. I want to come down a bit. Uh, we look at verses uh, eight, uh, verses six to eighteen. If you read verses six to eighteen, the Bible is saying, "Do not engage in incest and pedophilia." That's what it's telling you. And I think most people are most people, except for those involved in Pizzagate uh, and other things like the high judges and most of them that rule the earth um, want to stay away from this type of behaviour. Except of course with the internet we have the dark net where there's many, many men roaming the dark net taking pictures of small children. It's filth. It's abominable. But this is the nature of man when he walks away and believes that he's cursed of God. So 6 to 18 is there's a lot on pedophilia and Incest within the family, aunties and uncles, and all kinds of other nonsense. Now, this is interesting. Verse 19. In this list, in this list, it says that for husband and wife to come together during the time of her period will bring this abomination on the earth. It's abominable to God. Did you know that? It's got it in the list with everything else. Of course, verse uh, 20, we're familiar with verse 20, adultery will cause these problems to take place. Then, verse 21, child sacrifice or rituals to false gods with your children, causing your seed to pass through the fire. That's your children to pass through rituals, satanic ritual abuse, which we, SRA, all these types of things that are taking place. God says, don't do these things because they bring a curse on the earth. Verse 22, homosexuality. And then verse 23, 24, sodomy and bestiality. You engage in these things, then it tells you what's going to happen in verse 25. Leviticus 18. He lists all of these things and he says, this is what the Canaanites are doing and this is what the Egyptians have done. Why did the plagues come on, on Egypt? Because God wanted to smash the hell out of them? No, because they've been practicing these abominations and the earth couldn't take it anymore and these plagues erupted. Yeah. yeah. So, verse 25, it says, And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And this, is, this, this is, has a rather direct implication. Because men, of course, we are made of the earth. And when men have seed and they plant seed in the earth, and they plant it where they shouldn't plant it, in children and in other men, and all this sickness, when they plant their seed in the earth, in this way, it brings violence in the earth. It, it defiles the land. And the, what does it say will happen? It says, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself will what? Vomit out the inhabitants thereof. So when a woman is sick and she's not well and she's with child and things go terribly wrong, what happens to the child? Miscarriage. It vomits out the inhabitants thereof. And the child is aborted. That's what happens. On a large scale, that's what happens to the earth. The land itself will vomit out the inhabitants thereof. So what happened during the time of the flood was all these abominations were being practiced. And of course, what is the principle? What is the spirit of men? The children, their, 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 their daughters and their sons are not safe in their own homes. It is a spirit of a man that has lost his mind, that is so obsessed with pleasing himself that he has lost all regard for the well-being of the children in his own house. He is willing to destroy the souls of his own children in order to satisfy his lusts. This spirit going into the earth causes violence to erupt in the earth. The earth reacts to this in the destroyed souls of children and women and girls that are debauched by men with evil desires. And of course, 
women in their lost state dressing inappropriately to attract men for what they know not what. Why are they attracting the men? To get what? A beast mauling them? It's absurd. But this is what the world is like. And so we see this direct relationship between the thinking of men and particularly the sexual sins of man, the impact that it has on the earth. And so when Australia adopted the no-fault divorce uh, a principle when Playboy magazine began to be distributed throughout Australia and around the world and men began to fill up their mind with this type of lust the earth began to react and the next start part in the drama is Australia then enacts same-sex marriage the earth is going to react it's not because God says right I'm gonna get you back it's a law of nature it's a law that's built in and let's remember, for all of the horror at homosexuality, adultery is in the same list. It's in the same list. It will produce the same results. So we can all be holy about homosexuality. It's just another thing on the list. It's just another thing on the list. But it will multiply the effect of the curse. So you add these things. You add adultery. You add pedophilia. You add bestiality. You add... Sodomy, you add homosexuality, the earth eventually is going to miscarry and throw everything out. I can't deal with this anymore. And it aborts everything, throws it out. Wherever the earth has been cursed in this way. And Satan is busy to ensure that those who are the kings of the earth are those who are the most vile. It says in Daniel chapter 4 verse 29 that that God allows the basest of men to rule over nations. Why? Because it's their spirit that has the domination and control. He can take more control of the earth. And in the midst of all these abominations that are taking place, God has his angels holding back these winds of strife, trying to hold, hold, till we have sealed the servants of God where? In their forehead. There's so much that we could talk about. But let's come back to Genesis chapter 6. And this is the point that I really want to make. <laughs> the ark. What is the ark that we're going to build? This is amazing the way that God has written this into Scripture. Verse 14. Make thee an ark of... Genesis 6.14. Genesis 6.14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Yeah. Now the word gopher there, I'm reading uh, Gensenius Hebrew Chaldee Dictionary. The word gopher there properly means pitch. Okay, this is, and then it says, as I suppose and I interpret pitch trees, resinous trees, such as the pine, fir, cypress, cedar and other kinds of trees. So the word gopher is actually means pitch or resinous trees. Okay? Trees that have resin in them. That's what that word. So an ark of resinous trees or pitch. Now, what's interesting is that, that word is exactly the same word as we find in Genesis. It just blows you away when you read this stuff. Genesis 19.24. Just think about this. This is what the ark is made out of. The ark is made out of this material and it's exactly the same word that occurs in Genesis 19.24. And if that doesn't blow your mind, I'll be about it. Genesis 19.24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah, what? It's exactly the same word. Actually, I think it's one, one out. It's one, it's, it's Hebrew. 1614, but gopher is 1613. Gopher wood, and this is gopher rife. It's from the same root word, which means pitch. So the ark that is providing safety for the righteous is the brimstone that fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. Are you catching something there? Mm. It's the same spirit. To the righteous, it is light. To the wicked, it is death and destruction. It's the same thing. The ark is made of the same 
the same thing as the brimstone. You could say, the ark is made of brimstone. It's interesting, isn't it? And it only gets better. So, yeah, brimstone, gophereth, ark made of gopher wood. It's almost, uh, and it's, again, cypress resin. Now let's have a look at another text for this word brimstone because it gives us a definition of what the ark actually is. It's in Isaiah 30, 33. Isaiah 30, 33. It's amazing. Because we need to know what the ark is. This is what the ark is. And this is exactly the same word. As the gopher wood. For Topheth is ordained of old, yea, for the king is, it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large, the pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord is like a stream of brimstone. It's like a stream of gopher wood. The breath of the Lord is an ark of safety. That's what it's saying. But not to the wicked. Not to the wicked, but to the righteous, it is an ark of safety. And we notice. Uh, it says here, uh, like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. Very interesting. Therefore, the breath of the Lord is what the makes, makes the ark in the last days. Now, what is it that Jesus breathed upon his disciples? He breathed upon them his spirit. After he rose from the dead, he breathed upon him his spirit. That is the ark. The ark is the spirit of God. It is the word of God. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Okay? So we come back to Genesis 6 and it says, verse 14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark and thou shalt pitch it within and without. That word pitch is a different Hebrew word. Pitch, that's right. <laughs> the main translation of this word pitch is atonement. Covering. Covering. The ark is the spirit of God infused, held together by the atonement, the covering, the protection. I mean, this just blows my mind. But this, is, this is the ark of safety. A coming into the stream of the Spirit of God, to be breathed upon by the Spirit of God, covered by the atonement. That's what the ark is. As in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. We must understand the atonement. We must understand where the Spirit of God comes from. Atonement, 71 times. Purge, 7. Reconciliation, 4. Reconcile, 3. Forgive, 3. Purge away, 2. And pitch is only recorded once. <laughs> it's actually, you shall lay it within and without with a covering, the atonement. And what is the, the, the pitch itself? Of course, the pitch... Um, the pitch is from the... What's the actual, the actual word in the Hebrew? Has anyone got that? I no. thought I wrote that down. Yeah. Pitch, Hebrew, Pitch. three, seven, two, two four. four. Mm. Kofer. Yeah, Kofer. So, so pitch. This is the actual, um, the, the 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 resin. This is the this is the blood of the tree which is providing the atonement, because the resin is the blood of the tree, the blood of the gopher wood. And figuratively, it means a redemption price. A redemption price, figuratively. So a redemption price is being paid to hold this ark together, to hold the whole thing together. This is the ark of safety that we have to enter into in order to be protected from what? From the earth. From the earth. Spewing out its violence. And if we're not within that stream of that blessing of the breath of the Lord and have a correct understanding of the atonement, the violence of the earth is going to sweep us away. Can I read a comment that my mom put way earlier and I said, this is where you're going. And I think um, it's that now. Genesis 6, 
2017, God had to intervene. The end of all flesh would have resulted in no survivors, thankfully. And this again is a testimony to his character. He stepped in and saved the man. He stepped in and provided an atonement. Nothing left. The earth would have swept everybody away. Noah would have been swept away. This is phenomenal. And it's all, it's quite here. You just have to look up the Greek, the Hebrew words and it's all there. The ark is a correct understanding of the atonement. So now I want to just close on this particular point because it's very interesting to me. And I need to speak to you basically along these lines that over the last 17 years I've been on a journey to try and understand this point. The journey began with the book Identity Wars which is our value in our relationship with our Father rather than how we perform. That journey has led me to this point now uh, where, and we have some copies over there, the book Agape, an understanding of the character of God. Now what's, I want to read you something now from the beginning of this understanding of the atonement. And I just, it's just of interest to me, because I haven't read it anywhere else outside of this book by George Fifield, who was a companion with A.T. Jones, that the difference between the beginning of this understanding and this understanding that's in the final chapter of, these, of this book, the time difference between this and this is 120 years. Would, would exactly. Write, would you prefer to read this one first before you read the earth? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Good, okay. I just find it interesting that this understanding, this comprehension of the atonement, which holds the ark together, I haven't read it anywhere else, but at least in, for me, in my journey, from when Fifield first preached this, to, to a comprehension of what the atonement actually is, has been exactly 120 years. That's interesting to me. Now, maybe others have presented this uh, and put it forward, but not on the platform that we've been building on. That's very interesting. Now, let me read to you the statement that just caught my attention. Um, it's on page 48, and we've got copies of it over there, page 48. Copies of both of these are over there. Here he says, the word atonement means at one minute. Sin had brought misery, and misery had brought a misunderstanding of God's character. Okay, this is what this is all about. Thus, men had come to hate God instead of loving Him and hating Him, the one Father. Men also hated man, their brother. Thus, instead of the one family and the one Father, men were separated from God and from each other and held apart by hatred and selfishness. There must be an atonement. An atonement can be made only by God so revealing His love in spite of sin and sorrow that men's heart will be touched to tenderness and they being delivered from Satan's delusions may see how fully and terribly they have misunderstood the Divine One. So what is the atonement? The atonement is coming to a correct understanding of the character of God. It's a reconciliation in your heart with your Creator, with your Father. It's nothing to do with, okay, you've sinned and we've got to deal with this situation. Someone's going to have to die because I'm really annoyed with the fact that you've messed up my backyard, so you're going to die. That's how most people understand the atonement. The atonement is a revelation of the character of God's love in such a way that it turns the heart of man to realize I've been in error in understanding the character of my Father. That is the atonement. Amen. And that comes through the breath or the Spirit. The Spirit gives you this comprehension, awareness, to give repentance to Israel, to turn the heart of the prodigal back towards his Father. This is what the atonement is. And when we understand the character of our Father, that He keeps His own commandments, that He doesn't kill, then He will cause sacrifice and oblation to cease in our minds, constantly seeking to approach God through an appeasement-based system of trying to please Him. Amen, I've tried to do this all my life. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Amen. I always have this empty feeling. Never I'm not enough. good enough. Never enough. Never enough. 
constantly paying tithe, being a vegan, eating wheat picks, all of these things, living right, doing the right, looking down my nose at other people to make myself feel better. It doesn't bring atonement. It doesn't bring any atonement. But when I've looked into the loving heart of my Father, and I've seen the gift that He's given me, my heart has been turned towards the Father. Elijah has come to me and spoken to me and said, do you see what I'm really like? Do you understand? And my heart is reconciled. Be ye reconciled to God. That's the atonement. At one with him. To be at one minute with Him. It's an issue of the heart. All this discussion during the Protestant Reformation about legal justification. As if my father wants to take me to court to prosecute me. That's right. That's nuts. Mm. My father wants me back. He wants me in his arms. That's what he wants. It's a marriage. It's a marriage. This is what it's about. To believe it. And the reason I raise my voice is because I believe such nonsense. I've been deceived by Satan's lies and his deceptions. And all the while my father loves me reaching out to me and says, this is the atonement, Avery. This is the ark of safety. Because when the world goes crazy and everything's going to fall apart, and in your heart Satan is telling you, it's coming for you because you know you're wicked. You say, I know my father loves me. That's your ark of safety. Because there is a storm coming. Relentless in its fury. Is it like the story of Ruth when she laid down at the feet of Boaz? Covering. Atonement. Kinsman redeemer, of course. This is the picture. I'm so excited by this principle. And we don't have time because time is going away. I have to do this at another time. But in order for this breath of consciousness, it has come to us through the Sabbath fountain. The Sabbath, we are sealed in the forehead with the Sabbath. The Sabbath and the feasts is the channel of blessing, the stream of consciousness, the stream of understanding that we are His beloved children in whom He is well pleased. That is all part of the ark of safety. I have to go, go quickly. As it says in Isaiah, to be repairers of the breach, as you're bringing the pieces of the gopher wood together to repair the breach, an understanding of the Sabbath. And what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is rest. And what is rest? Being in the bosom of the Father where Christ dwells. And how do we get there? We are accepted in the Beloved. Ephesians 1.6 We are accepted in the Beloved. And that is the atonement. That is what... It's the Sabbath. That's why... Why does Satan hate the Sabbath so much? Because that's the place where Satan knows that Christ climbs up into the bosom of his Father, leans on his breast and knows, I know who I am. I'm the Son of my Father. And nobody can take this away from me. And he rests in that. Not in his omnipotence. Not in his omniscience. Not in all the power. He rests on the bosom of his father. And he knows who he is. And nobody can. And that's why Satan hates the Sabbath. Because he doesn't have that anymore. He's not a son of God. He gave all that away. For this wispy lie that he himself would be like the most high. And it will end in destruction for him. Because of this. But when we come into the Sabbath, if you reverence my sanctuary and you keep my Sabbaths, I will pour my Spirit upon you. We don't have time to get into the fact that it says in Peter that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. And Joel 2.23 talks about, I will send you the former rain. And what is the former rain? A teacher of righteousness. According to righteousness. According to righteousness. This is the message that is coming to us now. And I want to say to you, the ark has been built. After 120 years, the ark now has been built. The question is, are you going to come into it? The only question you have to answer is, in the face of all of my sinfulness and all of the wickedness that I've committed against God, do you still believe that God will forgive you and that you are His child? If you can believe this, you're in the ark. We're going to get tested on this. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. That's right. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound for those who have the faith of Jesus. That's how we're going to get through this. Because we're all going to get put into the wine press. And all the garbage and all the stuff. As we've been told in the Will Ross statement and other statements, a storm is coming, terrible as persecution. And are we going to say, oh Lord, though all others would forsake you, I will not forsake you. I'm not going to forsake you. What does the Bible say? 
They all forsook him and fled. Apologies to Philadelphia. I'm sorry. You're not going to be there. No one is going to be standing. Everyone is going to run and hide. The question is, how soon are you going to get back on your horse? Like John or like Peter? Some will be like John. Some will be like Peter. And it will be a bitter ministration of death to realize I really don't trust him as I think I do. But then, still, the Father is reaching out to you. And saying, I still forgive you, even though you deny me. Even though you call down curses on the earth in my face while I'm suffering uh, crucifixion, even though you call down all these curses, you're not going to see in my eye any anger towards you. That thought absolutely destroys me. And the way I treat people, the way I think about people, like wow I want that spirit and this is the thing blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness I want that and I believe that he'll give it to me and I say to my father morning and evening morning and evening Sabbath new moon and feast days I say to my father I want this spirit 30 60 hundred fold as it's promised to us in the scriptures and he says, you will not be denied. That's the, that's the promise that he makes to us. So the, 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 the invitation is here. I'm saying to you, after 120 years, the ark has been built. A relational understanding of the atonement, a correct understanding of the character of our Father, the correct understanding of the Sabbath in relation to the seal of God, all of these things have been put together for us. And all we have to do is believe it. Now, like our pioneers, you're going to have to study. Our poor pioneers, they had to study all the stuff on Daniel and Revelation. And they had to study through the prophecies and all that kind of stuff. It says in the book, Great Controversy, none but those who have fortified their minds with the truth of the Scriptures are going to go through the last great conflict. There's no gravy train. There's no easy ride. You have to, Lord, please teach me. Help me to understand. Now, you may not understand all the detail. You may not understand, but you have to do your best to understand how this ark is formed. So when the, when the bashes of the logs on the outside come up against this ark and try and knock it around, your anchor will hold. Add to your faith virtue. The virtue, knowledge. You must add knowledge to virtue. You can't just have virtue, you must have knowledge, which leads to temperance, which leads to piety, which leads to brotherly love, which leads to agape. That's the ultimate experience of God's people. And so I thank God that he has come to me these last days and he said to me, Adrian, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Thank you, Father. I am poor in spirit. I am now ready to receive the fullness of your inheritance in your son. If he hadn't come to me and showed me this, and I said, I'm Philadelphia, I'm not like those hypocrites over there. No, I don't need an infilling of your spirit because I'm full of my own. Only those who are poor in spirit are going to receive the seal of the living God. To be faced with the fullness of your wickedness and say, I still love you, son. It doesn't change the way I feel about you. And so I better finish. But I'm just very, very excited. We've found the ark. I encourage you to read and to study and to make sure, make sure that your anchor holds, that no one can take from you. When you get that feeling, you know, we're coming into the Sabbath last night. I, I, some stuff was going on. I started to feel that irritation in my spirit as we're coming into the Sabbath. No, Lord, no, I'm going to hang on to it. No, Satan's not going to take my blessing. My feelings are not the reality. Amen. My Father's Word is the reality. Amen. That's what it's about. And even though my feelings are contrary, even it doesn't matter. God's Word says that I am His child. Yes. He calls Amen. things that are not as though they already are. We should sing a song. Yes. Will you anchor hold? <laughs> Will your anchor hold? I wanted to sing Redeemed. Well, sounds even better. Yeah. <laughs> 337. Redeemed. Yeah.
reversing the curse. I pray, Father, that this message will grow in us, that we will take hold of this, help us to study and to know that we are your beloved children in whom you are well pleased. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you everyone who's joined us online and uh, we're now going to those of us that are here, we're going to head over to Paul and Dice so we can have lunch. Thank you. Thank you. 